I saw in a store back when you bought games on stores, uh, like on the back of the cover, it said like, you know, you can play any country in the world in this time period. And I was like, no, no computer can ever handle that. That's impossible. Like they're bullshitting. This has to be false advertisement. So I bought it and then it's like, I got stuck and then I kept playing and kept playing and then eventually got a job here. <laughs> I played the first Euro Brunner Solis game I thought it was really cool. Uh, it was, was really an innovative game for me. Euro Brunner Solis started as a board game. Uh, I bought the board game in the 90s, and then I figured, found a company in Stockholm that was going to uh, try to make a port of it. I basically contacted them and said, you want me? I'm going to be there, I'm going to make this game. And I basically got a job, and then I got, became in charge of making that title. Who the hell names the game Europa Universalis in the first place? Maybe you know the background that it was a French board game developer called Philippe Thibault, and uh, we licensed um, the rights to, the, to make the board game on a computer. And the first game was essentially a very creative board game adaptation. Uh, you know, we looked at the board game that already existed, but made a, let's say, board game inspired computer game because it wasn't really a board game, but it was fairly limited. I came in and was presented with this game that I essentially thought looked like almost like an Excel spreadsheet, but with images. And to me, that was different from any other type of games that I'd seen before. So my first impression was that, are these games? And then starting to interact with the community and just learning about what they loved about the grand strategy games was amazing and opened up a, a whole new world for me. EU practically invented a whole new way of looking at map-centered strategy games and most importantly, centered historical fidelity and player-driven narrative. I had met a lot of American retailers and all of them said the same thing. Is this turn-based strategy uh, like Civilization or is it real-time strategy like StarCraft or Warcraft? And we said, it's a hybrid in between and it didn't go very well with the retailers. So they said, everything that is a hybrid is a non, like you can't put a label on it and therefore we can't place it on the shelf. How do you win the game? It's, it's not that kind of a game. And so that was the resistance, that they didn't really know how to sell it. And that was also one of the main reasons why Paradox back in the day decided we need to become our own publishers because people don't understand what it is that we're doing. And they're trying to fit us into this box where we're trying to create a new box. So I first remember seeing uh, the very first uh, European Universalis, uh, you know, in a box from this, you know, company in Sweden, and it looked like this, you know, this very impressive deep game that maybe was even a little intimidating. Um, it looks like a game that wasn't afraid of history, wasn't afraid of getting into all the details. So, you know, I kind of got it right away because I was very curious about it. People didn't really know where to put us, so we were like, let's make our own box, the Grand Strategy box. Europa Universalis 3 in the cover, you will see that it says on the top, the Grand Strategy game, which is the first time uh, we use the term Grand Strategy. I think it's used in military, uh, in military history and in military tactics. I don't like uh, the definition of genres. Is this a strategy game or is this a uh, RPG or is this a thing? It just is. And, and it looks like, yeah, you can call it a game. I call it a game. You can call it a simulation one. Uh, but he's correct in that there's no like set victory conditions and there's no like, yeah, you win. It's like, yeah, it's more like life. How do you win life? Um, people don't care as much about winning or losing. They care more about the experience. They're more like kind of like surfing along through history. Um, and, you know, it was, um, you know, it was just very, very interesting because it felt like it existed in this this different world where there are all these things that we wanted to try and had failed at, but they were succeeding. All of a sudden, we have had our own niche that we could cater to. We had grand strategy, and uh, once you see, like every now and then, you see civilization now is being labeled grand strategy. So maybe that is what they call in civilization a cultural victory. I don't know. Why grand strategy? Well, it's strategy on steroids. Like it's so much strategy that you know that the the possibilities are endless almost and i think that brings us to another really key point in in the success of paradox's games paradox development studios games is the modding and the involvement of the players in may 2005 i joined the the forum uh joined the community and uh well never left <laughs> we're 
basically using all the tools that Paradox give us to, I would say, transform a bit the game uh, so that the game feels quite different from uh, what v the vanilla, the base game is. The game is the canvas and the content that the players are creating are what gives a lot of uh, extra flavor and then you can choose depending on what your preference is. What Paradox was doing looked like something that could appeal to a very, very small audience. Um, but, you know, in reality, you know, there's a lot of people who want to play historical games. The interesting thing with, with our grand strategy games is that we've always, we have always been the ones uh, putting a limit on ourselves for some reason. We've always said that we think the Europa Universalis crowd is 100,000 people. And then all of a sudden we sell a million. And then we say, we think it's a million people. And all of a sudden we sell more. So we, the truth is that probably it's 100 million people who could enjoy the game because history is one of the greatest like topics of interest for people. So I think we could probably reach a much bigger audience than we're doing at the moment. It has a lot of potential. You know, game developers tend to be pretty nerdy, which is why you end up with a lot of games that are about fantasy and sci-fi. Um, but to, to frankly, the, wor the world at large, there's a lot of people who care more about history. Um, and not necessarily because everyone's a history nerd, it's just that people can connect to it. It's, it's about humans, it's about something people know about, it's about their, you know, might be about your own country. EU4 was the first game where you have so many countries interacting at the map, and, and also every country is playing the same. So, you know, the, the, the AI for France and the AI for, you know, Brunswick, which is a mini country in Germany, they're both playing to win. In every game, it turns out differently. No one has done this before. There's a simulation, like, that is deep enough and, like, keeps the player entertained, and enough tools for them to fill with, and that then the AI, resp the AI is playing by the same rules, so the AI responds to you d fiddling with things and playing around in the sandbox. They're playing in the same sandbox, the AI. So it feels like the world is responding to what you're doing. And that gives you history. The player defines the rules and the player defines the timeline on where they play and what they do in the game. And that was fairly new to most people, I think, when they played Europa Universal. You know, it's like somebody gave us a fantasy world, right? And we can read the backstory and then we can imagine a new fantasy story in that, that setting. It's just that we don't have to do the world building, it's already happened. I want it to feel like you're playing that country, so I don't want it, you to miss out on like uh, religion or economy and military or anything you, just because it's a game. I want it to feel like a complete experience. We want to make games that are sandboxes. We want to make games where the, peop the player is in the center of the game and the player is the star of the game. And therefore we also came up with the idea that we make the games, but you create the stories, which is the foundation of all our titles today, basically. And we said that you should be able to play a game over and over again and have a new experience every time you play it. And therefore also the game design rules had to be broken. Endless games are kind of our thing, uh, where, you know, where we, we, we kind of build games that have lots of small components. If you look at all the games, it's very much like we have little game bits uh, and the complexity is not because we have a super complex simulation, but that we have fairly simple bits where we have a lot of them, right? But what makes it fun is that there is a simulation and that there is um, something that plays itself while you're playing your game as well and giving a sense of that the world is alive and feeling like it's a plausible history that you're playing with, right? So you start with like, all right, here's the starting conditions, 1444, this is the history, and go. It needs to feel like you're playing that historical period and it should, needs to feel like you're a little bit simulating it. But when we have to choose, we always choose the game. It's a game first. Historical computer games were largely war games. EU was much more than that. It was an ambitious attempt to simulate a world, not just armies. And over the last 20 years, EU has become an even deeper and more varied historical simulacrum. These are products made by passionate people that really like them, that are like you know uh, as passionate about them as the players are. Because we sit and play them on our free time as well. We care a lot about what the community thinks, uh, and I think having the the ARs, the, the discussions on the forums, the, the things that people create are really 
a very important source of feedback for us, right? They allow us to imprint our vision on the game as well. I'm rather proud when I see uh, stuff from mod ideas that get their way in the in the base game. We're creating games that we want to play ourselves. We are the target audience for these games because Europe Marisolis is, is the dream game. It's the game I always dreamt of making as a kid. I can't stop making them. Now they have a voice that carries over the world and let's see what they, what they make of it. But uh, with every release, they've just kept raising the bar and I, I think it's amazing to see.